Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 204. It's June 2017, and I am just back from speaking at the National Genealogical Society Conference. It was in Raleigh, North Carolina. And in fact, Bill and I are both back because this year we drove to the conference, which was a big change, um, on all the way from Texas. So it was it was quite a haul. It was a long drive, but we made a really fun pit stop on the way. We stopped at the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina. Not a bad place for a rest stop, right? (laughs) And we hit it just about the right time. Um, They were having a very special exhibition called Designed for Drama, Fashion from the Classics, which was inspired by George Vanderbilt's love of literature. And throughout the house, they were showcasing more than 40 award-winning movie costumes from films based on favorite books in his collection, like Sherlock Holmes and... Finding Neverland with uh, Johnny Depp and Anna Karenina, and of course, my favorite, Pride and Prejudice. Yes, I was in the same room with the costume that Colin Firth wore as Mr. Darcy. (sighs) It was really spectacular, and oh, we hit it just right. We got there at the end of a, a gorgeous, sunny Monday afternoon, and we practically had the whole house to ourselves. It was amazing. Tomorrow, we are going to hit the road again, and it's time for a road trip to Burbank, California, and the Southern California Genealogical Society Conference. And uh, this Friday night, I'll be keynoting at the banquet, and then Diane Southerd, your DNA guide, and I will both be there presenting conference sessions and in our Genealogy Gems booth, we'll be teaching some sessions in the exhibit hall. So that's what's been keeping me busy. Um, But I do have lots of news and gems to keep you busy. So let's start with the news, shall we? The news, a lot of the news has been coming straight out of my heritage. Um, We are your home here at Genealogy Gems for keeping up with the world's genealogy giants, as we call them. We're talking about those four big genealogical records subscription websites, the ones where you go, should I subscribe? Should I not subscribe? And and they have just huge volumes of records. So we're talking Ancestry, Family Search, which you do subscribe, but it is free. Find my past and my heritage. Well, this first news coming out of my heritage um, just recently is all about DNA. They have released a new and improved ethnicity estimates analysis. And the best part about this is that you don't have to buy a test there now to see how they have figured your ethnic origins. Their new genetic analysis covers 42 ethnic regions, and it uses data from their own study, which was more than 5,000 people who had deep documented roots in particular parts of the world. The really cool thing about this in my book is that this new ethnicity estimates is now available to everyone who uploads their DNA from other websites as well. So if you did your testing somewhere else, like at Ancestry or Family Tree DNA, you can upload those results and get this ethnicity estimates tool from MyHeritage. So be sure to look in the show notes for this episode. Now, this is episode 204. And uh, in your podcast app, you just tap on the PDF and that'll give you the show notes. You can also head over to genealogygems.com. And under the free podcast, you're going to go to podcast episodes and just scroll down to 204. Click that. You'll have all the stuff there on the web page for you. And there we will have a specific link for you and more information about all this and how it works. And these ethnicity results, they are offered up in a really different kind of fun way by my heritage, sort of a, a data visualization of your ethnicity, if you will. It's an animated reveal type of experience with original music 
as it moves like a video and reveals the ethnic results, it's going to be playing music tailored to your results. So blending music inspired by different regions, uh, if you have results from different parts of the world. What's neat about this, it's not that you have to have music or you need it to move like a video, but it's a super shareable on social media kind of thing that's going to grab the attention of other people in your family when you share this. Um, and maybe people who haven't tested or even people in your family who have really not shown any interest in genealogy. I think they will find this to be pretty darn cool. So we will have a, an example also in the show notes for this episode so you can see what this looks like and what you could be sending out to your relatives. The other new thing at MyHeritage is a catalog for searching record collections on the website. Again, you can use this whether you are a subscriber or not. So if you have a free subscription, you can still use this catalog. And it really helps you see easily whether MyHeritage may have the historical records that you need. The catalog is going to include collections that have at least 500 records in them. So, and, and I think a lot of them probably do. I'm guessing that's a very low number when it comes to records uh, for any one collection, but uh, keep that in mind as you're looking. So it's not every single thing, but it's all collections with at least 500 records in them. Our Genealogy Gems contributing editor, Sunny Morton, sent over some comments about these new features. Of course, she's the author of our brand new quick reference guide. It's called Genealogy Giants Comparing the Four Major Websites as well as our MyHeritage Quick Guide. She wrote that as well. And both of those are available, of course, in our online Genealogy Gems store. Here's what Sunny said. She says, MyHeritage is playing to the strength of their geographic diversity with their updated DNA ethnicity results. For the sake of comparison, Ancestry DNA's test covers 26 genetic regions. MyHeritage's covers 42 Ancestry DNA reports Italian and Greek roots as a combined percentage, and my heritage separates them out. At Ancestry DNA, you have to purchase your test from the website to see your DNA results, and you can't upload results from other websites. Both of those things, though, you can do at my heritage. And she goes on to kind of compare the two that Ancestry DNA does have the largest database for genetic genealogy connections, and they do have powerful tools for looking at matches and historical migration groups in your family. But my heritage is starting to distinguish its DNA product, and she says she'll be curious as the, their database grows to see what their geographic diversity looks like and what additional genealogy tools they're going to add to it. As far as the new MyHeritage catalog, Sunny suggests that you could use it in three different ways. To look for specific record types for a particular place and time period, uh, to see what's new on the site or what collections have been recently updated, and to see how many records are in any particular collection, which I always think is kind of interesting. This may help you determine how comprehensive a particular database might be and whether you should be looking for other or similar records in different databases. Speaking of record counts, MyHeritage also recently described how they count records over at their website. And as Sunny points out in our new Genealogy Giants Guide, this is a pain point when you're trying to compare the different genealogy records websites, these subscription sites, because they might count their records differently. For example, at FamilySearch.org, they count a birth record with a baby and two parents as one record. The record belongs to the baby. Well, my heritage counts each name in a record. So the baby's birth record with both parents actually counts as three records for three different people. It's one more thing to keep in mind as you're evaluating which websites you want to invest your time and your subscription dollars in. And Sunny's Guide is really a must-use resource for helping you answer that question on an ongoing basis. Because as we all know, our research needs change, and uh, which website you might want to be using can change as well. So the guide, Genealogy Giants, Comparing the Four Major Websites, is available at our online store at shopgenealogygems.com, or you can go to genealogygems.com and just click store. Well, that's some of the latest news. Um, I've got news from you as well, and we'll do that over at the mailbox. Let 
letter from my old hometown. One with some jokes from my old pal Jim Brown. Bring me a letter from that girl of mine, saying that she's longing for me all the time. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad, who knows that we are winning, and I bet he's glad, but more than any other, a line from my old mother. Bring me a letter from my I've heard recently from a couple of groups who are enjoying following the Genealogy Gems book club. Megan from Hunting Down History recently sent us a thumbs up on the book club on behalf of her genealogy study group. She says that some of her friends are using the book club recommendations for a summer reading program list, which is a great idea. And here's a similar email from Mary Lovell Sweetnam a reference librarian at the MEO Central Library in Virginia Beach, Virginia. She wrote in and said, Thank you for all the informative materials that you provide to your listening and reading public. I certainly enjoy my time with you. I wanted to particularly thank you for the genealogy book club idea, which I have stolen from you, (laughs) imitation being the sincerest form of flattery. I'm responsible for the development and provision of genealogical, archival, and local history programs for the Virginia Beach Public Library, and I thought that a genealogical book club would go well with our enthusiastic family historians. I set it up so that the club rotates through our different branches and meets on a variety of days and times. Readers can also use Goodreads to post a review of the books. I read 40 books before choosing the final selection. I tried to pick two books for every meeting, assuming that some of my readers would need variety. We had great attendance and vocal readers at the March meetings. Wow, 40 books. Our book club guru, Sonny Morton, totally feels your pain here, or rather your pleasure if you love to read. Sunny reads a ton of books too until she finds just the ones she loves for genealogy gems. And she only gets to pick four a year. And I know sometimes it's a really tough choice. I sent Mary links to videos about two genealogy gems book club titles that her club picked since I think that the group would really enjoy watching them. Uh, I'll put these in the show notes for you as well. One of the videos is Genealogy Journey, Running Away to Home. Remember that with Jennifer Wilson? And we had another video called You Came and Saved Us with Chris Cleave. And of course, he is the author of Everyone Brave is Forgiven. And those are two great titles that they included in their book club. Mary Lovell had a suggestion for us, too. She says, I don't know if you have read Not My Father's Son, but I recommend that you watch Alan Cummings' episode of Who Do You Think You Are? and then read the book. You'll want to watch the episode again after reading the book, because you get really interesting insight about his life during the filming of the show in the book. Thank you for the tip. In the show notes, I will link to a Find My Past blog with a detailed episode summary for the Alan Cummings episode, and I will also link to Alan's book. And you know, I don't get a chance to read a whole lot, recreationally, I should say. But I, of course, I loved Fanny Flagg's book. She's our, our current um, featured author. And I picked up a copy of another one of her books, The All-Girl Filling Station's Last Reunion. Wow, this w- this one would have been great too for book club. It's a terrific book and uh, just a wonderful, really fun, easy read, and, and so interesting to see Fanny Flagg weaving in genealogy and DNA, <laughs> DNA for genealogy. So, oh, and it's just great. It's got a whole history about um, the women flyers in World War II. So check that out if you haven't read that one yet either. It's called the All Girl Filling Station's Last Reunion, and uh, I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Well, I've got one more letter to share today, but I'm going to do that later in this episode because I want to go a little more in depth with my answer to it. But coming up right after this, a genealogy gem, Dave Obie. Bring me a letter. 
letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I'll bet he's glad For more than any other A line from my old mother Bring me a letter from my home This episode today is brought to you by the 4th Annual Northwest Genealogy Conference. It's hosted by the Stillaguamish Valley Genealogical Society, north of Seattle in Arlington, Washington. Centering on the theme, where does your story begin? It's four days packed full of genealogy. There will be well-known and respected keynote speakers, including our friend and genetic genealogist, Diane Southard, speaking on DNA, Kenyatta Berry of Genealogy Roadshow fame, speaking on Caribbean research and using slave schedules in research, and Daniel Earle speaking on putting history in your family history. Starting off with the free day Wednesday afternoon, speaker Peggy Lauritsen will address beginners' issues in her Genealogy 101 presentation, which is also a really good refresher for the more seasoned genealogists. There'll be such great genealogical information for all levels, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Between classes, take a chance to meet a distant cousin with the cousin wall. Participate in the genealogy-related scavenger hunt, the Wednesday evening meet and greet, and the Friday dress as your ancestor day, and much, much more. Go to NW, like Northwest, GC, like Genealogical Conference, dot org, N-W-G-C dot org, for details and to register. Check it out now. Registrations are limited, so it's good to get in early. The conference is going to be held August 16th through the 19th, 2017, in Arlington, Washington. It'll be a great show. Don't miss it. You've probably found wonderful old photos and documents in your research, but that's not exactly exciting stuff to your kids and your grandkids. The truth is, the non-genealogists in our families aren't captivated by the same things we are. But you can change all that with Animoto.com. Start creating fabulous videos about your family history that they won't be able to resist. And you don't have to have any special skills. With Animoto, you drag and drop your files in, like photos and even video clips. Pick from their professional styles and huge music catalog and voila, you've got an awesome video. I've made dozens of these and my family loves them. Hey, my grandson didn't mention the Legos that I gave him for his birthday, but he did thank me for the video that I made. You've got to try this out for yourself. Visit Animoto.com. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage, which has over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. Post your tree on MyHeritage and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees, not just with genealogists in the country where you live, but around the world. Trees aren't primary sources, but they are excellent leads. I uploaded a portion of my family tree that contains my German heritage, and that's where I was really hoping to make a breakthrough, and very quickly it happened. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany. That was my first international cousin contact. But there's more at MyHeritage. Their unique and powerful search system, it's called Record Matches. It constantly calls over 5 billion historical records for your family. It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. It is also the first to translate names between languages. Find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. In Genealogy Gems podcast episode 203, you heard the first half of a fun conversation I got to have with Canadian research expert Dave Obie. 
We ran out of time before we ran out of things to say, so I've got the rest of the conversation to share with you today. Listen for a fascinating story about a British movement that long ago pushed thousands of children across the sea to new homes in Canada. Dave, you mentioned to me that there's been a major development regarding vital statistics records in Alberta. So what has happened there recently? Well, it's it's finally fantastic news from, from Alberta. Like I've been working on genealogy now for almost 40 years. And Alberta has always been a real, real problem area because the rules there have been such that, that the government could not release um, the, the they couldn't show us the stuff. To, to we we couldn't see any indexes uh, of vital stats, and we would if I, if I was able to, to to see something at the archives, I could take a paper or like a pencil copy of it. Um, oh. I couldn't actually get a photocopy, or you could go through the government, and if you could prove a relationship to the person, then for forty or fifty dollars, they would send you a photocopy. Wow. Well, now they've posted online on the Alberta um, archives website copies of their indexes and they're not perfect because they're basically name registers whatever where you for this time period you're looking at all of the all of the people with with say you know for cook for instance might might be all the people with a name starting with co Mm -hmm. in this group of group of you know so you still have to scan through and find a whole bunch of different names but it's available now and it it hasn't been for years uh it's never been available before um in the first week that that was that was up i went through and um sent off orders for 58 certificates. And the certificates were costing me... Did you help crash 35, the site? <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Yeah. Um, the certificates are costing 35 cents plus postage. Oh, so terrific. So this has gone from being one of the worst areas for research for one of, to, to one of the best. You know, and, and the, I don't necessarily like the, top, the date range on, 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 on things because it's, uh, it's, um, it's 120 years closure on births and a 50-year closure on deaths. Um, and about 75 for marriages. I forgot that one off, off the top of my head. Anyway, I think it's 75 years for, for marriages. Um, but still, I'm getting access to things I've never seen before, and it's incredible to finally, to finally have that. Like British Columbia, um, our death records are posted online after 20 years. So oh. Alberta is catching up. Boy, a big difference just between provinces. Well, of course, that happens in states as well. You know, when you think about alternatives, when you can't get your hands on something in records like that and vital stats, you could turn to newspapers. And I'd love to turn to newspapers with you, being a newspaper man yourself. And I know that you talked a lot about newspapers um, as a resource in your book. It was the Canadian Immigration and Naturalization Records you were talking about in Destination Canada. Right. And uh, I'd love to know, what should we be looking for? And it's kind of exciting to think that we might be able to get some hints on that immigration information right out of newspapers. Well, in terms of immigration, um, there there usually is information available. You might not have like the names of the families, whatever, but what you will get would be from the port cities involved. You'll have the arrival of the ships. There'll be a story on, on, say, the New Amsterdam coming in, the number of passengers on board, in which class and so on, any issues that came up during the, the voyage. And any notable people on board. Um, so what that means, you know, if you know that your ancestor came on that vessel, for instance, now you've got some background information there. The other thing that I find interesting about that is is the numbers of of people um, listed will never ever be the same as the number of people who show up on the on the passenger list. And you even have an issue sometimes where you've got the outbound list from from England, the inbound coming into Canada. So you've got two different lists there. And they will never agree on the names. I hope they're not throwing them overboard. <laughs> What's going on? Be. What's going on over there? <laughs> You're not on the list. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, so it's 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 fascinating to to realize that that you know maybe you can't find a person because for whatever reason um, they, they 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 were not recorded at one side or the other. So you always check both sides. Whenever you get right. two sources, you check them both. Uh, just to be on the safe side, and and that to me was was, was interesting because. We always like to believe that there are certain sources that are absolutely above reproach, that they're absolutely perfect, they always work, they always have our people. Uh, you can count on, on these sources. I'm not aware of any sources. I was going to say, do tell broke. which ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've, 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 I, I keep hearing that there are some, but yeah. I've never found one. You know, yeah, I, I, I've been able to prove, you know, in one case, how, how all of the official government records on one person were wrong. The newspaper told the truth. 
<laughs> but by, by bringing together about five different newspapers telling the full story of the person's life, I got it. All of the records were wrong. Well, the, wow. the proper records. Uh, in terms of in terms of newspapers and immigration, I talk about how the how the there's a variation between the, the outbound and the incoming and so on. That if I when I've added up the numbers in each class of, of of passenger, they don't match. Neither one will match the newspaper. So again, it's giving me the rough count. It's not absolutely perfect. But what I get a kick out of is finding out if any problems were encountered on the voyage, notable people on board, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the kind of thing that adds color to genealogy. If I can tell mom, for instance, that, that she had this, this, this voyage back when she was two, it's kind of cool for her to yeah, understand that. Absolutely. In newspapers, are we going to find people looking for people who immigrated or looking for a mail order bride or all those things that we tend to see in our American newspapers? Uh, sometimes. And, and there, were, there were specifically, like, like they were called bride ships coming in with, uh, into areas where, uh, where, where there were a lot of men. Mm-hmm. Uh, bride ships arrived, and, and the, these were women coming in basically looking for husbands. And, and those were reported uh, in, in the newspapers. Um, I don't, haven't seen a lot of you know, lost love uh, type ads, whatever. I have, seen pe- I have seen ads for people who had gone missing. Wives were saying, where did my husband go? Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, not, not for, the, for the husbands that I know in my family went missing from their marriages, whatever. Um, but, but, the, but there's a lot of different, different things like that, people looking for people and so on, a lot of things on the settlement of different areas, different, um, you know, this, this is happening there, that's happening there, a lot, a big, the big gold rush into the Klondike is happening, all that kind of thing. But I've got words of caution about newspaper research because with so much digitization work being done, um, I find that more and more people seem to be just relying on the search engine to get them into where, what they want to look at. And OCR, as you mentioned already, OCR is not perfect. Uh, the computer will not necessarily read the old newspaper with its faded type and its this, the, the creases and folds in, in it and so on uh, very cleanly. Even if you, if, if you take a, a perfect modern-day sort of 12-point Times New Roman text and OCR it, you might get about 90% accuracy on it. Mm-hmm. So when you're dealing with the older stuff, it'll be much, much worse than that. And so always, the search engine is nice, but once you find some good hits in the search engine, just browse through the newspaper and read what you can find, because you'll find more. And in some cases, one of the best stories in dealing with one of my family members, there were, there were no names given in the story. So, so that will never come up in a search engine. Um, but, but by browsing through the pages and realizing, wow, this is describing my family absolutely to a T, because all of the parts of this really strange incident, you know, they fit. They fit what I know to be true. Um, I wouldn't have found that if I'd if I'd stuck to the search engines. I find even even books now, uh, new books that are coming out on local history, in, in the footnotes or whatever, you can tell that they've been simply diving into not the entire uh, publication. They've been, they've been looking at uh, at, the, at the words that came up in the search engine. Mm-hmm. So always look beyond that. Absolutely. I think of it like uh, the shoe leather of a good detective. There's nothing like boots on the ground. And that's kind of like eyes on the page. You just need to go through it yourself. In fact, I agree with you. Some of the best stuff I have found uh, didn't actually search on a name. It was by the address. And it was the occupants of that address. But it was all the sort of details, you know. And you know, according to the census, that's your family that we're talking about. In the U.S., we publish obituaries and birth and marriage announcements. And I know in the U.K., similar items are called, I think they call them family notices. So how have Canadian newspapers kind of generally covered those individual births, deaths, and marriages and divorces? It's it's varied considerably over the years. Um, Back, you know, even up to about 50 years ago, you'd see divorces mentioned. Now it's incredibly rare. Uh, there are privacy rules and so on about that, uh, but I, I remember like like I've been in the business now for forty five years, and in my first few years as a reporter, I remember getting the lists in every year of the people who had been divorced in our community. That did happen. Obituaries are are, are fairly commonplace, um, but they vary tremendously from newspaper to newspaper or, or region to region. In some areas, like Winnipeg, Manitoba, has probably probably the best obituaries in the country. Um, because they're so long, they have so much information in them. And I think what happened there was that people got in the habit of 
people started to believe that's what an obituary should look like. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when they go to place an obituary, they know that they're, they're going to fill a column or whatever. In other areas, they're much, much shorter. And there's no guarantee you'll find an obituary anyway. There, there's, no, there's no requirement that, 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 that the passing of a person will appear in a newspaper of, of any sort. Um, the, the, the obituary is up to the family. Uh, beyond that, there's no requirement. There, you know, the, the, like, like there's, there's no sort of vital stats list or whatever. I see those in some American papers. I don't see them ever in Canada. Um, and and, and it, it can be frustrating because sometimes you have family members who um, they were the last of the generation or whatever, and they were estranged from their kids. There's no obituary for them. Right. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, so so it's, there's no guarantee on that. Things like, uh, like marriage notices, um, they have become exceedingly rare. Um, up, up until about 50 years ago, you'd see them, and then, then they start to disappear from the larger papers than, than the smaller papers. And birth notices are they're even more rare than marriages probably at this point. Yeah, oh, I, you're talking about I, currently, right? How currently, currently. How about going now going back 100 years? Are we going to have some good success? Back 100 years, I would say uh, you might have uh, one out of every five births. Oh, okay. You might have, and it, it also depends on the area. You might have, a um, hundred years ago, I would expect that you would find almost all the marriages mentioned, except if uh, one of the parties was, uh, was divorced or widowed. Um, mm. Very rare to find one of those. Even and widowed? They had to, even widowed. If, if they were both single, you'd find a reference in the paper. Interesting. And why that was, I don't know. <laughs> but I just it, don't want to say it out loud, I guess, that they were yeah. married before or something. It's... Of course. With my, uh, this is off the topic just a bit, but with my relatives in Skagit County, I found one case where, where the couple split up, and they both married other people. But in the 1900 census, they both show as being widowed. Ah, uh, like you said, because they couldn't record that it was divorce. Yeah, they were yeah. both living in the same place. Wow. So there you go. So always be careful what you read. So true. No matter whether we think it's one of those uh, perfect sources or not, we know there aren't any perfect, but um, there are none. understanding the background of those sources, that's something that's so key. That's right. Before I let you go, I um, wanted to chat with you really quickly about something that I know that we've been seeing in the news lately this last year about the home children of Canada. And mm-hmm. as I understand it, 10 to 12 percent of Canada's current population, which I guess is about 4 million people, descend from home children. So can you give us some quick background? And then we can talk a little bit about kind of what the conversation is these days on that topic. Yeah, the, the first thing I would say is that I, 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 I would actually question that number. Really? I think it's a bit on the high side. The 10 to 12 percent? Yeah. It's I, been, it's certainly getting out there as kind of the the standard, but uh, I wonder if they're talking about people who actually were home children or just descended from them. Well, th- th- that would be descended from, but but it, it still seems a bit high really? given, given the number that came in. But whatever, it doesn't matter. I know there were yeah. a lot, um, and um, there have been many, many. Uh, uh, there, there's a database available at Library and Archives Canada with with home children. Um, there were there were a variety of different uh, outfits that, that brought home children in. What the home children were basically were were the orphans, or in some cases, simply kids given up for adoption. Um, you know, a, a large family in England, um, possibly the father or the mother died, and, and the kids had to, had, to, had to get a new home. And, and so they were given up and, uh, to one of the different companies involved, and they, they, that included people like, uh, like the Bernardo Homes, the, the, uh, I think it was called uh, Middlemore, mm-hmm. um, and so on. The, uh, Fairbridge was another one. Um, they, they all basically were doing what appeared to be the best thing for the kids and shipped them over to Canada and some to Australia, that kind of thing. A lot of these kids ended up effectively in slave labor uh, mm-hmm. for a while. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of bad, bad memories and so on about this. They, they, were, they were just ripped out of the, from, the, from, their, their, from a loving family in some cases in England and, and end up coming to Canada and working on a farm um, from dawn to dusk. And uh, at the same time, a lot of them went to, went to basically residential schools of one form or another and did get educations. I've, I know some, some academics who have done some research into home children trying to find out, because, because you know, what we hear now is, is all the negative. And they've told me that they've actually found many people who, who were delighted by their home children experience. And, and this, this lasted for probably 75 years, into the 1930s even. 
we were getting these kids sent over. And then during the war, we had more kids sent over, um, basically for protection, um, mm -hmm. you know, for their own, their own safety, whatever. They came over as well. Um, but there are there, there, it's, it's a controversial topic. It's a tender topic. Uh, because, as I say, there's there's been a, a huge discussion about whether it was really the good thing to do or not. Right. Um, and I know there was a apology from the government this year, what, February? Didn't they do an official one? And I think that's kind of stirred up that conversation. But I, I have. I've read positive, you know, gosh, I was living in this, you know, my grandfather was living in the street, and now they he actually came to a farm and got an education. I imagine that in the end, it was individual as to how people, what they experienced. It was individual. Like I, I've read, I've read both sides. Like, like, and and I've also gone through the files here because we had some of these, these, the, you know, the farms for the kids to live on. We had some in our, in very close to where I live, and the the, the newspaper stories at, at the time were all fairly, fairly positive, upbeat on on how wonderful it was for the kids. Um, I'm not sure we can believe those because those were those were being you know presented by the people who ran the farms. Of course, right. they're, they're, of course, they're going to say it was great. But I've also read some biographies that, to me, are just horrifying in terms of um, how they were basically. Nobody said a word to them. They were taken to a train station in England. Then they go to the, the bigger station. And then they're off to the port. They get on a ship and they're confused as can be, not knowing what's going on. They get to Canada and they get on, on another train and they go for seven days across the country until they, they arrive at a farm somewhere. And now what do I do? You know, and no, I, no clear understanding of what had happened to them. And then they're basically, you know, following orders from that point on. So it was fairly ugly in that, for, for a lot of people. But as I say, others have reported it was a good thing. Um, but that said, there, there are a lot of different sources available. Library and Archives Canada is a great starting point for that, for the home children. And there are different home children organizations set up to, to sort of bring people together to a certain extent. I imagine that DNA is playing a big part in this continuing story as well, kind of reuniting. You hear of people being reunited. I definitely. I, th I think that I think we've reached the point now with DNA where DNA you can't imagine doing re or doing doing research without DNA now. Uh, the same yeah. way that you know twenty twenty years ago um, we could go to a genealogy seminar and we, and and there'd be one session on how to use the internet right <laughs> for your genealogical research. Now it's it's simply accepted that we use the internet and and there are no special sec special sessions on how to do it because it's all it's all obvious. Um, I think DNA is reaching that point very, very quickly, where if, you, if you're not using DNA, why are you doing this? Why are you doing yeah. genealogy? Yeah. Well, well, we could talk about that, too, but that's a whole other topic. I, I want to thank you so much for just kind of taking us on a, a tour of a lot of different topics, which are specific to Canada, but like I said, I'm sure are um, applicable in some form. Everything, everybody always gets a little nugget out of the different ideas, even if it's just to do exactly what Dave said, which is sometimes you, you put your own eyes to the documents themselves and don't rely on just those search engines. Right. Dave Obi, thank you so much. It's been uh, too long. We had you on YouTube on a video that's done really, really well, but it's so nice to have you here on the podcast. Thanks for taking the time out. Glad to be here. For more information on all the things we chatted about today, check out the show notes for episode 204. You know, when folks ask my advice for organizing and securing their family history research, I say plant your family tree in your own backyard and just share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard means keeping one master family tree in a software file on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. Well, my software of choice is Roots Magic, and that's for so many reasons. I find its tree building tools second to none, simple yet powerful and flexible. With Roots Magic Web Hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. Ancestry.com web hints are coming soon, as is the ability to sync your Roots Magic database and your Ancestry tree. Roots Magic has excellent online free training videos, an active user community, and a companion app for on the go access. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at Roots Magic. 
you know, now that I've moved to Texas and what they lovingly call Tornado Alley, I'm more aware than ever that if anything ever happened to my genealogy files, I would be devastated. And boy, have my files expanded since I started this research at the ripe old age of eight years old. As genealogists, we don't just have paper files anymore. But we also have digital files like our genealogy database and precious old photos that we've spent hours scanning. No matter where we upload our family tree or anything else relating to our family history on the web, the responsibility for the total safety and security of our files lies with us. That's why I'm so proud to announce that Backblaze is now the official backup of Lisa Louise Cook and Genealogy Gems. For the past few years, I've been researching and I've been test driving backup services and hands down, Backblaze is my choice. It's certainly the easiest service to use. And I love their free app that allows me to access all my files on my smartphone and my tablet. Plus, it backs up everything, including my video files. Yikes, I didn't realize before looking at Backblaze that other services skip over backing up videos. So don't wait another day to ensure that all your files are safe and secure. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head to backblaze.com slash Lisa and scroll down. You'll see my smiling face there and a great offer. Just 50 bucks for a year's peace of mind and the best cloud backup around. Go to backblaze.com slash Lisa. And now I've got a great gem for you from Kate Ekman of Legacy Tree Genealogists on tracing your ancestors from Great Britain. Or do you mean England? Well, let's let her tell you what you might mean. Hi, this is Kate Ekman. I'm a senior researcher with Legacy Tree Genealogists, and today we're going to talk about the Beginner's Guide to Tracing Your British Ancestry. With about one-third of Americans claiming British ancestry, the chances are that at some point you're going to want to extend your research across the Atlantic Ocean. Today, I want to clarify some of the confusing terms we use with the British Isles and provide some pointers to help you get your genealogical research started on solid footing. First, let's talk about British and English genealogical research. There are several terms that we tend to use interchangeably but they really refer to different locations. Great Britain is actually an island, and it's the largest island of all of the British Isles. On the island of Great Britain, we have three sovereign nations that make up the United Kingdom, or what we call the UK. That's England in the south, Wales to the west, and Scotland to the north. The fourth sovereign nation that makes up the United Kingdom is Northern Ireland, and that's on the island of Ireland next door. Usually, when people talk about their British ancestry, what they really mean are their English ancestors. Although Americans generally treat the two words as being interchangeable, they really aren't. And I suspect that our English friends kind of giggle a little bit when they hear us misuse those two words. The four countries of the United Kingdom have some similarities, but many important differences. And those differences sometimes affect how you should conduct your genealogical research. But rather than trying to explain all of the differences in each country, I just want to focus on English research today. And one more thing to keep in mind when we talk about genealogical research in England is that today the country is divided into counties. Older records might refer to them as shires, and over time the borders have shifted and some shires and some counties were added or divided or absorbed into each other. So a good map or two can be a useful tool to keep handy when you are researching your English ancestors. Now, before you make the leap across the pond, it's always a good idea to consider what you already know about your English ancestors. You probably already have a name and maybe even a date of birth or an approximate one. Were you fortunate enough to find the name of a town or a county where that ancestor lived? Or do all of the census reports or vital records or passenger lists simply say England? 
Do you know what the occupation of your ancestor was? Do you know when he or she arrived in the United States? Are there any clues on the passenger list to tell you where to start looking in England? Maybe they tell you the name of the parents who were left behind. It's always best to first exhaust all of the record sources in the country your ancestor immigrated to in order to find all the available details and clues that might help you to identify and trace them in the English records. Once you've accomplished that, it's time to start your research in England. Now, the first step that most genealogists use for studying any of their ancestors are the census reports, and that's true in England as well. Just as in the United States, the English census was designed as a means to count the population every 10 years, and the census of Great Britain includes Scotland and Wales, with the earliest census available from 1841. Due to very restrictive privacy laws, the most recent census is from 1911, with one really valuable exception being the 1939 register, which is available at Find My Past. The census is able to give us a snapshot of the family at the time that the census was taken, and it also provides invaluable information such as the birthplace of the individual, his or her occupation, their birth year, and all of their various family relationships. Just as we can use the census in the United States to find elderly parents or widowed mothers living with them, our ancestors also did the same thing in England, and so the English census can be helpful for finding other members besides the immediate family. Of course, some drawbacks of a census are that they can be inaccurate in the spelling of the name, or the age might be inaccurately reported, and sometimes the enumerator makes assumptions which are not correct. One oddity of the 1841 census is that the enumerators were instructed to round the people's ages down to the nearest five years. So if your ancestor is listed as being 25 years old, he could have been 26 or 27 or 28 or 29 years old. And so that's important when we're looking at these census reports is to remember in 1841, the age will probably not be as accurate as it is in other years. And of course, other censuses might have the age vary because somebody else, another family member or a neighbor reported the information. Finally, we also want to remember that census reports through 1901, the enumerator copied the information into books and then these copies are what we have today. And of course, anytime we have anybody copying anything, there's a chance for error entering in. The person who completed the census form might have had handwriting that was difficult to read, or the enumerator might have entered things on the wrong line. The original reports have been kept for the 1911 census, so there's a much greater likelihood that the information they contain is accurate. Detailed transcripts of English census records are available for free on FamilySearch, and the images can be found for a fee at MyHeritage, Find My Past, or Ancestry. In addition to census records, we also have civil registers of births, marriages, and deaths. In England, all births, marriages, and deaths were required to be registered in a civil registration office beginning in July of 1837. In addition to the records themselves, there are also indexes which list the name of the person who was born, married, or died, the place where the event was registered, and the quarter and the year in which the event occurred. So if you see a registry index that says July 1875, that doesn't mean that the person was necessarily born in July of 1875. That means that they were born in the quarter that includes July, so July, August, and September. And because the General Register Office or the GRO will only search one year on either side of the date that's provided when we ask them for records, it's very helpful to include the index information when we order those birth, marriage, and death records. There's a free database called FreeBMD, which allows you the most freedom to search for the birth, marriage, and death index records of your ancestors. You can enter whatever information you know, including the place where the event happened, a specific year or range of years, the person's age, and even the mother's maiden name or the spouse's name. Depending on the time period, the index could be handwritten or it could be mechanically printed. That information, though, is used to order a copy of the record from the General Register Office in England, and those usually cost a little bit over $10 per record. Birth records include the name and the date and the place of birth of the individual the father's name, assuming it was given, and his occupation, and the mother's name as well as her maiden name. 
After 1869, the name of the parents' is place of birth is included on a birth record. And after 1984, the mother's occupation is also listed. Marriage records include the date and place of the marriage, the name and the age of each the bride and the groom. It also will let you know if the bride or groom was previously married, widowed, divorced. Their occupation, the name and occupation of the fathers of the bride and the groom. And a note will be made if either of those men was deceased. And of course, the names of the witnesses and the name of the person who performed the marriage. Death records are a little bit different in England from what we usually find in the United States. Most United States death records include the names of the parents, and so we find them very useful for genealogical research. In England, the names of the parents are not included on death records, and so they're not quite as useful for our purposes. A death record will tell you, of course, the name of the person who died and the date and place where the death occurred, the occupation and their usual address, the cause of death, and the date and place of their birth. That's after 1969. Before 1969, it will just tell you the age of the person who died. So birth and marriage records are very much like we expect to find them when we've already completed U.S. research, but the death records don't have quite as much information as we're expecting. Now, there are other records that are available, which we can talk about another time, that can be used to help find your English ancestors. The largest group are religious records, and sometimes those can help you to extend your family back in time into the 1600s or even earlier. So just remember, Great Britain is an island, the United Kingdom is a country, and England is a country within the United Kingdom. Normally, when we're talking about our British ancestors, we are really talking about our English ancestors. England has counties, or what used to be known as shires, which function something like our states here in the United States. The borders have changed, and so have some of the names, so maps are really helpful. Census records are available from 1841 through 1911. You can find some great transcriptions for free at FamilySearch, and the images can be found on several for-fee sites. And remember that weird little idiosyncrasy about the 1841 census and rounding people's ages down to the closest five years. Finally, we have civil birth, marriage, and death records that you can order from the GRO, the General Register Office, and you can use index listings to find the most likely match for your ancestor. And the easiest place to access those is at the website FreeBMD. So those are some tips for starting your research into your English ancestors, and we'll talk more about other tips in a later podcast. My name again is Kate Ekman, and I work for Legacy Tree Genealogists. We love to do British research, whether it's for your English, your Scottish, your Welsh, or your Irish ancestors. And so if you're needing help, feel free to give us a call and let us show you what we can do to help you find your British ancestors. Thanks to Legacy Tree Genealogists for sharing occasional tips with us and giving us the boost of information and confidence that we may still need to cross the pond with our family tree. And if you'd like to get some help with a professional genealogist like Kate, you can save $100 off a 20-hour research project with Legacy Tree Genealogists. And that's through July 31st, 2017. It's a special deal they put together for us here at Genealogy Gems. When you purchase it at their website, LegacyTree.com, be sure to use the code GG100. And it's capital G, capital G, like Genealogy Gems, 100 to get that exclusive $100 discount off a 20-hour research project. release Genealogy Gems Premium Podcast Episode 148, which will have our much-anticipated book club conversation with author Fanny Flagg about her novel, The Whole Town's Talking. Fanny's voice is as easy to listen to as her writing is to read, and my associate producer and audio editor, Vanna Thomas, picked out a short clip of that interview to share with you right now, and here it is.
Hi, it's Sunny Morton, Genealogy Gems Book Club Guru. Today, I'm beyond thrilled to introduce you to Fanny Flagg, a New York Times best-selling novelist and one of the most beloved American storytellers of my generation. I'm so pleased you came on the show today, Fanny. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm thrilled to be on with you, Sunny. It's, uh, you know, I, I'm very interested in, in this subject, so it's a treat for me to talk to you. Well, thank you. So really, Fanny, I think we could talk about any one of your novels today. (laughs) I've mentioned several of them to our listeners in the past couple of months. You tell the best stories. Well, thank you so much. To me, they always talk about having a sense of family and community, and you always put your stories into historical settings and that I love and then fill them with funny and flawed and memorable characters <laughs> whom I also love. Um, so I really appreciate you being here today. Um, we are going to focus most, I think, today on your newest book, The Whole Town's Talking. Congratulations on that book. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, this, believe it or not, Sonny, is my 10th book, and that's a shock to me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's a pleasure for me, because I just check another one off the list and keep going with you. So let's start with the setting. Elmwood Springs, Missouri is a place I've come to love. It's a wonderful small town. You've taken us there before many times. So why did you take us back to Elmwood Springs again? And more specifically, why did you take us back to its beginnings? Well, um, the first of all, let me tell you why I picked Elmwood Springs, Missouri. I, I wanted to write uh, about middle America, which is what I do write about. Uh, and so uh, some people, you know, uh, a lot of books I'll put in the South and or whatever, but I wanted to, to kind of write about middle class people in middle America. So I looked on the map and I thought Missouri seems to be pretty much in the middle of, of the country. So Elmwood Springs, Missouri is this small town that I write about quite a bit with the same characters that represent uh, to me a typical small town. And so why we went back uh, to Elmwood Springs again is that um, I finished my last, uh, the book next to the last one, it was called The All-Girls Filling Station, uh, last reunion, and um, that was set in uh, Polanski, Wisconsin. So um, I, I, ta- I was talking to my agent, and I said, oh, gosh, you know, I've got to come up with a new idea for a book. And she, she said, well, you know, she's in, she was in New York, and she said, why don't you write about that little small town, you know, those little characters that you do so well. And I said, well, thank you, honey. I said, but unfortunately, I said, I've killed off most of them. <laughs> and, and she listen to this, Sonny, because she's an agent. Of course, she paused and she said, "Well, I wouldn't let that stop me." Well, I got oh, so tickled, funny. and I thought, "Well, this is true." So I thought, what I can do is, I've you know, a lot of people write sequels, and I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll write a prequel, and I will go back uh, to the very beginning uh, in the 1800s when this town was founded. And then we get to see the characters that we have known. And, uh, basically, uh, Elmer Schimpfel, who's in her 80s, and we get to see her as a young child, and we get to see the town growing from the beginning. And I'm quite interested in how little towns in America got started, uh, where people came from, the countries that they came from and settled and, and uh how they migrated all over the country. So I, uh, my uh, gentleman that founded Elmwood Springs, Missouri, happened to be um, a Swedish immigrant because his name was Nordstrom. And uh, so that's, that's to, to, long story short, that's how I decided to do it, is to go back and do history. And you know I love things in history. I'm fascinated with particularly American history. And um, the the strength of this country basically started in 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 those small towns and and uh, where we just kind of uh, moved out from there.
If you're listening through the Genealogy Gems app, your bonus content for this episode honors International Archiving Day on June 9th and gives you an exclusive introduction to a new voice here on the podcast, Melissa Barker, the archive lady. As much as I love finding gems about my genealogy online, sometimes you have to go offline, and that's fun too, to original records to learn what you want to know about your family. And Melissa is going to join us next month in the Genealogy Gems podcast to talk in depth about archives. But with your Genealogy Gems app, you can hear a preview segment right now. So remember, the Genealogy Gems app is free in Google Play, and it's only $2.99 in the Windows and the Apple App Store. Profile America, Saturday, June 24th. For centuries, the month of June has been the most popular choice for weddings. One of the purported reasons was that some hundreds of years ago, this time was just after May's annual bath, so the happy couple and guests were about as clean as could be hoped. With the ensuing advances in plumbing and overall hygiene, dressy weddings are readily staged year-round, from simple civil ceremonies and backyard or back-to-nature vows to elaborate church functions. Each year, there are more than 2.1 million weddings across the nation. Americans are marrying at older ages. The median age at first marriage for women is now 27.8, up five years since 1980. Men are now an average age of 29.7 when they first take their vows. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Can I just say, thank goodness for modern plumbing and today's sweet-smelling weddings. Goodness gracious. And and I want to also shout out for two happy anniversaries. The first one to my wonderful eldest daughter, Vienna, and her husband, Dave. Uh, Happy 10th anniversary. June 2nd was their 10th anniversary. It's amazing how fast it goes by. I think it's even faster when it's your kids, don't you think? And a special thank you to my hubby for a wonderful 33 years. Happy anniversary, Bill. That's all for today. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. Learn more about me and everything Genealogy Gems at my companion website, genealogygems.com. Thanks for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.